read this book today, oh boy Adapted from an awful musical And though the film was rather bad Well, I just had to laugh A fitting epitaph but then a comic came to be George Perez handled all the art you see But when the film became a bomb Not to be published here Because the book was late and cause the film reduced us all to tears the book was printed, though, indeed In French and Dutch and maybe Japanese Rock opera turned to printed page Well, I just have to look at this comic book And now it's trans In 1977, producer Robert Stigwood sought to adapt a stage play of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band into a film musical. Despite an incredible soundtrack of Beatles songs redone by the Bee Gees, Peter Frampton, and a host of other musical talent, it was a box office bomb, yet was still adapted into an issue of the comic series Marvel Super Special. Welcome! the show, 400th episode, instead of Sonic or Devil Deals or Racist Spiels, we're doing something fun, I'm in my coat, in my hat, made a bunch of cyber mats, done the show so long and here I am, singing to that cam, time to dig into this thing. The book was a nightmare to work on, with no support from the studio and a script that changed every day. It ran late, not that it mattered anyway, because the movie tanked so hard that it was decided to not release it in America. Strangely, instead of making the next super special, an adaptation of the pilot episode of Battlestar Galactica into issue 7, the numbering persisted, and so in America it jumps from issue 6 to issue 8. But yes, this book was in fact published in non-English speaking countries. Music in comic books, oh boy! 4,000 books like this they never learn No sound and plot holes, big or small I couldn't count them all Now let's dig into this book and see just how they dropped the ball Because it's translated And welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. This is the 400th episode. Let's dig into Marvel Super Special number 7, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band!
Hello, I'm George Burns. Just roll with it. I'm here to serve as your narrator through the events of Atop the Fourth Wall's 400th episode. You see, given the source material, Lankara decided he needed to do this as a rock opera, so he'll be singing all his lines. You'll need me to navigate you through the jokes properly. It seems Lankara couldn't afford the budget to do the whole episode singing, so there will be musical moments throughout the review. I am therefore superfluous, but I still get paid, so either way I win. Our story begins on a familiar futon where everyone was wondering just how Lankara would open the episode. 400 episodes. Eight years. And with such a long time between the start of this show and this current point, it's easy to forget our roots. Most of the reviewers who started around the same time I did were inspired by the angry video game nerd. And so, in his honor, I must ask this. What were they thinking? So we've got an album of songs by the Beatles turned into a musical, turned into a movie, turned into a friggin' comic book. You know, at least when they adapted Street Fighter the movie into a comic book, the transformation from source material to end product involved some similar elements. We've gone from an auditory medium to one completely bereft of audio. It's totally understandable why this thing ended up being a disaster on almost every level. How did nobody at Marvel realize what a mistake this would be? They were knee-deep in this before anyone stopped and said, Oh God, what are we even doing? But what's more baffling is that despite all that work and money they already spent on it, they decided not to release it in the USA. I mean, you did the work already. Sure, it wasn't going to make that much money, but you could have serialized it as a backup story for other Marvel Super Special issues, or even released it as a double feature with something else. There were other solutions than, hope nobody notices there is no issue 7. The great thing about doing this as the 400th episode is that it covers two topics we've talked about at length in this show, combined together to highlight the follies of each. The aforementioned singing and music part in a comic, plus a movie adaptation. But then we have a whole new problem on top of those. It's a movie where 90% of the dialogue isn't dialogue. It's song lyrics. Song lyrics that don't necessarily match up with what's happening in the story because they were written under entirely different circumstances and context. And one song, Come Together, is, by John Lennon's own words, gobbledygook, as in it's utter nonsense. And thus I must ask that question that started this, what were they thinking? While this was still early in George Perez's career, he was the best pick for a project like this, since he's one of those artists who works best when he's dealing with a cast of hundreds, with great dynamic action scenes, distinctive characters, and awesome facial expressions. He had already done Marvel Super Special Number 4, which was a biography about the Beatles, where he emphasized design and imagery to try to talk about the Beatles' music, since of course they couldn't actually put any music in the thing. Doing the Beatles comic is what landed him the Sgt. Pepper adaptation, but according to an interview, the book itself was a disaster from start to finish. They got no assistance from the Robert Stigwood Company, and the movie script was still being changed during filming, so elements put into the comic were getting dropped, or new stuff was being added. He even said that he was happy it never got released in English. Fortunately for me, one of my wonderful fans took up the task and not only translated it, but altered the artwork of the scans to be in English so the majority of you out there can follow what's happening. Thanks, Sheila! Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was an album conceived of by Paul McCartney. The idea was that the album would be as if it had been made by a fictional band going by that name. This would allow the songs to be highly experimental, with shifting tones, as well as new sound work and types of instrumentation utilized in it. It was definitely something the band had needed thanks to the exhaustive tour schedule they had been going through. Blasphemous as it is to say, though, I actually prefer the movie versions of these songs to the original Beatles ones. As said, they were experimental, and as a result, they sound experimental. Like a rough draft or something. Some of them are still great, of course, but I just feel that for some, the Bee Gees perfected them. But then again, what the hell do I know? 400 episodes and I'm still never going to be as popular as the Bee Gees. So let's finally read this sucker and see how the hell they pulled this off. The cover is 
bizarre. It's a photo cover combining various bits of promotional artwork into one image, but the problem is that that means we have multiple copies of the titular band appearing on it, even in the same outfits. Hell, they actually copied and pasted the shot of them with their arms outstretched from the middle into the lower right of the page. And here we see George Burns applauding the clones while he's sitting inside of a cheeseburger like he was some bizarre fast food themed Davros. And can I just ask, what the hell is going on with the shots of Barry Gibb? Up top he's okay, but in the middle shots he looks like his head has been squished a bit. How could they do that to him? I'm Barry effing Gibb! <laughs> Welcome to Sergeant Pepper and his Lonely Hearts clone saga. Look, there's even an oversized George Burns terrorizing the people down there. We open with George Burns narrating to us. Bombs. Guns. Death at any moment. Ah, Black Friday at Walmart. Destruction everywhere. Never mind, it's Warner Brothers corporate headquarters after the release of Batman v Superman. It's World War One. George Burns is Rod Serling in The Twilight Zone, The Untold Story. And yet, in the midst of battle's deafening chaos, a joyful music rises. And even the German soldiers stop to listen to Sergeant Pepper. Not realizing that Sergeant Pepper was known to lull his enemies into a state of euphoria with his music before a platoon then mowed them down. You'll never believe what happens next. Oh great, even comics from the 70s had clickbait. A magical melody filled their hearts with peace and happiness. Suddenly, all combative thoughts vanish as the soldiers head towards the sound of the drum to march alongside the orchestra, the Lonely Hearts Club Band. So basically, Sergeant Pepper was a Pied Piper-styled supervillain who took over the world with mind control. May I ask what may be a dumb question? Why is it called the Lonely Hearts Club Band? Lonely Hearts are basically singles hoping to find a date. While trying to look up info about this, it was suggested that the entire album itself was about alienation and loneliness. All the lonely people, as it were, that the band was the spokesband for such a club. Well, that's the case. Why the hell are they all so damn jovial about it? Does that mean they're uniting the world in sorrow? And if all of that is true about the name, does that mean that Sgt. Pepper was the original emo band? Crawling in my skin? Bah! Get yourself some for the benefit of Mr. Kite, dang it. It's not surprising that for having produced such miraculous music above and beyond the call of duty, the U.S. government presented Sergeant Pepper with the highest distinction, the Purple Staff, an imaginary medal for an imaginary band. And really, you ended World War I with this band and yet all you get was a friggin' medal? I mean, can't we give them anything else? A new car! That's a start, but I don't know. Maybe the Purple Staff grants you tax immunity or something. Believe me, my friends, everyone loved the famous Sergeant's music and listened to it. Everybody was pirating it. During the Roaring Twenties, the band was playing, and all the young ladies were dancing the Charleston wildly. Well, some of them are dancing the Charleston, others are apparently doing the can-can. Through the Great Depression, the band was playing, and people were dancing their troubles away. People were starving on the streets, tuberculosis was rampant, but who cares? We get to dance to a jaunty tune! Geez, I knew the Great Depression was bad, but I didn't realize women had to sell their bras and panties. Or maybe this is just the Great Depression at a nudist colony. During the economic recovery, the band was playing, and couples were gracefully waltzing around. But then they decided they actually liked being naked in barrels more. Even during World War II, the band was playing still. Are you sure about that? Because it looks like they exploded in this panel. And I've got to agree with the Cinema Snobs review of the film. Was this how the concentration camps were liberated? Now, speaking of, I should probably contact him since, you know, reviewer dibs and all. I have existed since the morning of the world, and I shall exist until the last star falls from the night. Although I have taken the form of Caius Caligula. Sergeant Pepper comic. Oh. When the hell are you gonna do the Caligula comic? Anyway, the band continues to play for another 40 years. Although I've gotta say, for being a supposed war-stopping band, the fact that they keep having to stop world conflict shows that they're not particularly effective at it. In the town of Heartland, a celebration is held to honor Sergeant Pepper, including a commemorative statue. Or rather, as Mr. Kite points out, a Sergeant Pepper weather vane. It shall always point the way to happiness. Strangely, it keeps pointing at the liquor store. Unfortunately, when the aged Sergeant Pepper raises his trumpet to play, he has a heart attack. But then, suddenly, 
the music faltered, weakened, and died. So bye, bye, Mr. American Guy. In his will, Sergeant Pepper left his daughter's family all his property, save for the magical instruments, which were donated to Heartland itself and stored at the City Hall. Where there are actual statues of the band instead of just the lame weather vane. Admittedly, probably waxwork dummies, but still better looking. Admittedly, though, if I got a statue, I think I'd want it to actually look like me in my prime and not how I looked right before a fatal heart attack. These instruments have the power to make dreams come true. And they're all mine! All hail, Emperor Kite! But they must never leave Hotland, because without them, our days would be miserable. Let's face it, there's not a lot going on in this town without them. Others would have the power. Others could have anything they want. Hey, I'd like to use these all-powerful, dream-fulfilling instruments to cure diseases and make people's lives better. No, I'm sorry. If you did that, some podunk town will be kind of bummed. Sergeant Pepper apparently also left his fakey medal with his other grandson, Billy Shears, even apparently leaving instructions for him to start a new band. Considering the last band ended two world wars, you gotta love how it's now up to this kid who may not want this life to now create a new version of it. Not to say it shouldn't happen, just that maybe you should get his input before thrusting the responsibility on him. But of course, he did indeed decide to form it, so I look forward to Billy Shears and his Lonely Hearts Club band putting an end to the Vietnam War and then deal with Saddam Hussein. Mr. Kite is dragging out the waxwork statues, since Billy's new band will be ready to play once they see the exhibit. And yeah, I guess we decided to let the single old guy drag out the massive statue instead of, like, hiring people to help out for this momentous day. Billy's brother, Dougie, who serves as the band's manager, introduces the new band to the super white town of Heartland. A few years ago, four boys got together and formed a new band as Sergeant Pepper's Legacy. Today, they will sing for us a legendary piece. Night fever, night fever, we know how to do it. No, of course, they sing the title song. I'll give this comic credit. Unlike stuff like Night Cat or Batman Fortunate Son, since they're just singing Beatles songs, and because this is an adaptation of a film musical, we actually know what the songs sound like. At least I do. See, the other problem with doing this comic is that it was made for 1979, which requires the reader to actually have a copy of the soundtrack or to have seen the movie to know what these versions of the songs sound like. But if you have the soundtrack, why are you reading the abridged version of the lyrics instead of just listening to it? But anyway, yeah, Billy starts singing. What would you think? If I sang out of tune, would you stand up and walk out on me? Not for that, but I think I would for the huge Billy you have emblazoned on your overalls. Why do you need a name tag? Hell, all the band members have those. Even Dougie has one in his hat. Why? Never since the original Sergeant Pepper stopped playing did children, young people, and elders feel so happy together. Although there was that one time we all became obsessed with the Beach Boys, but we don't talk about that. We're then introduced to Strawberry Fields. Yes, seriously. As she's helping an old lady from the Heartland Retirement Home get a closer view of the band, the old lady bobs her head joyfully. She's under the charm. She too has had her free will stripped from her and joined the hive mind. Something changed from the movie to the comic is that in the movie, Billy was already talking to Strawberry Fields before he went on stage, whereas here, he's singing about love at first sight and then spots her in the crowd. Dougie also notices the young woman, but she shows no interest in him. Dougie is astounded. He hates being rejected. Dougie proceeds to write several slur and expletive-filled essays about how feminism is evil and has caused women to reject his manly bowler hat. For Strawberry, this song has become a personal expression of the affection Billy has for her. She is instantly creeped out by this and files a restraining order. With the end of a successful concert, a telegram suddenly arrives for the group. They read it, and good god this artwork! Just look at the Bee Gees' mouths hanging open! Look at their cold, dead eyes! Can't sleep. Bee Gees will eat me.
So, what was the telegram? The world's biggest record company just found out that your music is fantastic. News travels fast. No kidding, considering you don't have an album yet, nor did you send any music to this record company, and better still, your group just premiered five minutes ago! But yeah, the company wants a tape of their songs. Never before did something like this happen to someone from Heartland. I mean, sure, the original Sgt. Pepper ended wars, but getting a record deal? Now that's impressive! By the by, one sign of the script constantly changing is that the narration specifically calls out that Strawberry's parents disapprove of the new version of the band. It is a plot point that goes absolutely nowhere and is never mentioned again. Nor does it even match up with the movie, where her parents are just as excited about them as everybody else. After Billy and Strawberry make out on stage in celebration, the fair they're performing at draws to a close, and Mr. Kite starts singing I'm Fixin' a Hole, for no particular reason, other than the fact that it was on the album. Mr. Kite thinks he's at home here, and he's right. Wait, I thought Mr. Kite was the narrator. Anyway, the band records their tape in the most logical of recording venues, a barn. It's getting better all the time. Well, your sound quality isn't. Although maybe this is just a rehearsal. I'm not seeing any recording equipment aside from the microphones. What really sucks is that they had to shove out Lapis and Peridot to do this crap. Strawberry Fields is with them, but we soon see that she is being spied on by a nearby RV. Inside of the RV is mean Mr. Mustard, who has his own robot servants that serve him hot dogs. Martha, you didn't put enough mustard on these wieners. Batman almost stopped Mr. Mustard's evil plans, but then he mentioned that his robot was named Martha and he had to let him go. Mr. Mustard soon gets a message from something called FVB. We hate love. We hate joy. We love money. The RIAA became a lot more likable once they stripped away the pretense. We cut over to BD Records headquarters, which are two giant pyramid-shaped buildings in the middle of Los Angeles with magic eight balls on top of them. Well, I've got to give the comic this. It's got balls. B.D. Brockhurst, in the movie played by the late great Donald Pleasance, is listening to the band's sample tape alongside a group of fawning women, identified in the narration as Lucy and her diamonds. Yeah, yeah, cute and all, but I'm more confused about the presence of the little pig statue with B.D. written on it. The hell's up with that? Anyway, B.D. Brockhurst is trying to decide if he should sign them up. After all, the village people are going to be releasing Can't Stop the Music soon, and that's going to get their careers going again! Then again, I'm sure B.D. will appreciate the music. After all... My name is Pleasance, and I am funky. Lucy lustfully licks her lips. I'm going to eat this photograph. B.D. agrees. They will become the greatest band in history. And I shall call them the Dave Matthews Band. And they will be his, provided someone doesn't snipe him on the auction. The telegram informing the group of their acceptance is sent out. And delivered by, who else? The world's oldest Western Union messenger. Who arrived three months later because he took a rowboat to the town, got lost along the way, and had to forage on animals in the woods because he never learned how to drive the damn delivery truck. The telegram arrives, saying the band needs to be in L.A. tomorrow. Billy and Strawberry say their farewells that night, presumably just holding hands, because Heartland is as innocent and squeaky clean as you can get without scrubbing so hard you remove the paint. But their potential romantic interlude is, of course, being observed by mean Mr. Mustard to make this as creepy as possible. The morning comes, as does the sun, allowing Strawberry to sing again. Yeah, if it wasn't clear by now, they actually included songs from Abbey Road as well as the original album, yet didn't put in two songs from Sgt. Pepper. Within You Without You, and Lovely Rita. And fair enough on Within You Without You, given the nature of the song and how it's all metaphysical and crap, but why the hell did you leave out a love song about a specific woman named Rita that could have easily been written into the movie for Sandy Farina? I'll get more into this a bit later, but needless to say, it's just an odd choice to leave out. Another change from the movie is that instead of the band flying by hot air balloon until a plane collides into them to transport them to L.A., they just fly out on said plane. There's no sadness in this potting of ways, only joy, because the boys are gonna be famous, and it's all right. They are gonna have so many groupies, plus hookers and blow, and it's all right. But is it real? Los Angeles's foggy, noisy, and luxurious commercial landscape unfolds before them. Everything seems so different and revolting to the freshly out of Hotland boys. Which you can really see, what with this picture of an airplane landing. 
However, the boys are soon pacified by the arrival of B.D. Brockhurst in a platinum open-top limousine. The driver of the limousine is, in fact, Lucy herself. Jeez, you make your singer also act as your chauffeur, B.D.? I don't know if you're worse than Sony or just as bad as them. And knowing that, I'm guessing he's actually here to make the band polish the limo. Hop in, kids. We have a lot of stuff to cover. No time to waste. Pleasant mobile away. As the boys are impressed with the bright lights big city of the town, BD pulls out the contracts to try to get them to sign right away. Dougie, being a greedy idiot, signs it, but Billy and the Bee Gees are uncertain. Lucy decides to use her siren song to lure him into the contract, so she starts singing I Want You So Bad. Fortunately, unlike the movie, Donald Pleasance does not also start singing it, since that would kind of break the spell. A group of motorcyclists soon drive up around the limo. They are being escorted in style by Lucy's diamonds. Nah, those are clearly Lucy's cubic zirconias. And Lucy herself? Why is that being said over an image of one of the motorcyclists? Is she meant to be a double of Lucy? Holy crap, maybe there is some kind of clone saga going on in this book. But how can that be? For she is the Kwisatz Haderach! And so they enter the city to discover decadence. Yes, the pure decadence of people walking around on the streets. Well, okay, there is this naked woman poster that somehow made it past the censors. Well, actually, I know exactly how it made it past the censors. That's really Donald Pleasance. We soon see a montage of what I presume are the Diamonds, or at least a bunch of women in bikinis, making out with the band and getting them to sign their contracts. With the band being overwhelmed by the groupies, BD thinks to himself how advantageous this will be to him. I'm gonna make millions with these guys. And you know what? I'm okay with that. Dr. Loomis deserves to retire in comfort after all the crap he's been through. The band's first album is a success, and I just realized that the pig thing from BD's office might be intended to be a bulldog, given the BD abbreviation. But yeah, a nationwide tour soon follows. Dougie earns a lot of money, and all the shows are sold out. However, controversy would soon erupt when they signed a tie-in deal to Nabisco, upsetting the Keebler company after declaring, We're bigger than Cheez-Its. Back in Heartland, mean Mr. Mustard and his assistant, Brute, have broken into the town hall and are stealing the magical musical instruments. Which, despite the fact that they can make anyone's dreams come true, they have about as effective a security protecting them as a note left on an open cardboard box in the street with thousands of dollars inside of it that reads, Please do not steal. Mr. Mustard plans to send three of the instruments off to his cohorts and keep one for himself. Such a dirty old man. Okay, we know that because he was perving on strawberry fields earlier, but how the hell does Mr. Kite know that? How up-to-date is he on the seamy underbelly of Heartland? Mr. Mustard declares that he will become Heartland's king, and somehow accomplishes this, both in the movie and in the comic. You can't even say he used the instruments to do it, because as soon as he stole the instruments, he shipped them off. Somehow he just gains control of the town from Mr. Kite. Was there an election? Did the town owe Mr. Mustard a bunch of money or something? I will change its name. We won't call it Hotland anymore. But Mustardville! Even the gazebo has changed into a cheeseburger! My god! Mayor McCheese was behind this the whole time! And yeah, the gazebo change is the only major problem we see with Heartland. Sure, there's some condemned buildings in the background, a little more litter, and the leaves have fallen from the trees, but the leaves falling could just mean the season is changing, and I have a difficult time believing that Mr. Mustard could make people litter more. If he really is in control of the town, all that means is that he cut back on public works projects meant to clean the place up, which implies pollution was always a problem, it's just the city was better at cleaning it up. In the movie, it's stupider in its own way, implying that the major things introduced that ruined the town were, one, an arcade, DAMN YOU PAC-MAN! And two, prostitution. And I hate to break it to you, but it takes two to tango. In the film, clearly they're making money off of said prostitution, so obviously there was a market for it. You know, if these musical instruments are the only things keeping Heartland from devolving into this place, doesn't that imply that the instruments have even worse mind control powers? Just because the end results are positive doesn't mean it isn't still shady. All you did was replace your Gotham City with the Stepford Wives. Naturally, Strawberry is upset by what's been going on in her city. Most 
mostly it was about the gazebo, though. She just thought it looked tacky. And so she decides to get on a bus and find Billy, but Mr. Mustard spots her departure and goes after her. Arriving in L.A., Strawberry is briefly accosted by some bikers. Hey, honey, what's wrong? Man, Lucy and the Diamond's biker gang really went downhill fast. She suddenly spots a billboard up high that declares, Lucy and the Diamonds, the most wicked show in town. What a weird poster. I know, right? You'd think BD could afford a better advertisement than just plain text without even a picture. Strawberry is entranced by the message. Seriously though, what message? It fills her mind and a sudden vision appears. Said vision turns out to be Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band playing alongside Lucy and the Diamonds, all together singing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And then she sees Billy making out with Lucy, which she shouldn't know about unless she's psychic. And how the hell did a billboard do that to her? What the hell is going on? Why is a band called Lucy and the Diamonds singing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? Why does her group exist only to make this reference? It's not even really the sky, it's just kind of tall up. Why did it take so long for Black Canary to arrive in Gotham? Why the hell did Whatley want to spread the evil of Silent Hill through a celebrity murdering people? How would that even work? Why did they put Prometheus' helmet back on and cry for justice? Why did Kyle Rayner get so obsessed about defeating Sonar in JLA Act of God? What possible reason does anyone have to work for Harvest in the culling? Why does the Thing want to settle down in New Zealand and fall in love with some random woman? Why is being a pure-blood human superior to the genetically enhanced in Sci Spy? Why did Marvel think we wanted to read about the sexual escapades of Aunt May? I just... I don't... 400 episodes! I, I can't take this anymore! Linkara's spirit was broken. 400 episodes of terrible comics with bizarre plots and awful artwork finally took its toll, and he needed to express himself. Naturally, given what we're working with here, he's doing it in song. Pictures and word balloons mashed up together. It's sequential art and beautiful prose. But then you see it, an ungifted artist that draws an impossible pose. Twin clones of Hitler and bimbos in time, Tandy computer with kids. Psycho Man Raver, Star Trek meets X-Men, it's all real. What the hell did I just review? What the hell did I just review? What the hell did I just review? I Go back in time and meet God and the devil Trade in your marriage at the car wash of doom Everyone cries for both justice and brute force But countdown can rot in its tomb Super Pro Laser, that's Jello Man 2. Santa the Barbarian. Snowflame the Culling and Holy Terror, it all sucks. What the hell did I just review? What the hell did I just review? What the hell did I Bad comics come in all types and all flavors From Frank Miller's story to PSA Hell Sci Spy Commandy Teenage Super Foxes It all makes me just want to yell What the hell did I just review? 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 
What the hell did I just read you? What the hell did I just read you?